this morning I want to preach on the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is this gospel? Let's turn our Bibles to Romans chapter 1. The gospel of Jesus. Romans chapter 1 verse 16. This is Paul speaking by the help of the Holy Spirit. Are you able to do that on the screen for us? Okay. Romans chapter 1 verse 16. It says that, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God. Unto salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power. It is the power. So, when we come to church every Sunday, by the grace of God, when we read the scriptures, when we sing about Him, and when we talk about Him, we are talking about Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior. The Bible says that there is power in the gospel, the good news, and it is about Jesus. There is power in talking about Jesus. There is power in talking about Jesus. Power that is made available to you to be able to live this life in a way that God intended it to be. Power over sin. Power over every weakness. Power over every obstacle in our lives. This gospel has the ability to carry us over. Amen. Amen. That is why we have to engage the gospel. Because within it lies our hope. If the politicians in the world today and all the leaders in the world will embrace the gospel, I believe that there will no more be the need to be investing the billions of dollars in the accumulation of arms and wars. All that money will have fed everybody. Put clothes on everybody and give him food that you can pack in your house that will last for years. But instead we are piled up ammunitions and arms and we are fighting and killing each other. Because the gospel is absent. But the gospel of Jesus Christ has the power to give us the grace to go through this life. In spite of all the storms that life has to offer. Amen. Amen. And because of that, Paul said that I am not ashamed of this gospel. Is this one off? It's off. Yeah, I think this was uh, on as well. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. So it has power. It brings salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. So you can see that there's a, a coming together of two cultures, the Jew first and also the Greek. Because we know that Jesus Christ came first for the Jews and then also the Greek and the Gentiles have been brought together. So there has come together a merging of cultures, a merging of the people of the earth through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Only Jesus can bring people together. Hallelujah. Amen. Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Romans 16, verse 25. Now to him that is of power 
to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith to God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Amen. Let's go to verse 25. <coughs> now to him the heavens of power to establish him according to my gospel. There is God's power is able to establish us. So it is not the doing of man. When we cling on to the source of the power, we shall be established. We shall move on from strength to strength. And he says, it is going to be established through the preaching of what? Jesus Christ. So when we come to church, and I come to stand here, or somebody is standing here and is trying to share the gospel, and we are focusing more about ourselves more than Jesus Christ, that is not going to establish us. The truth of God's word is that Everything that we say and do must be centered in Jesus Christ. He's the one who establishes us. He's the one who will make us strong. He's the one who carries us from victory to victory. Hallelujah. And so it says that this gospel is able to establish you through the preaching of Jesus Christ. According to the revelation of the mystery. So Jesus Christ is a revelation. Okay, we have been told so many times, and we've heard it so many times, that Jesus came into the world. It is undeniable. Okay, the records are there, and the sites where Jesus lived and walked are, I mean, still there. People go to Jerusalem every year to visit these places. The tomb is still there. The Sea of Galilee is still there. All the places that Jesus visited, the Mount of Olives, is still there. And people go and they see these places. But I tell you, God will reveal Jesus to you because it is a mystery. Amen. It is not just about hearing the gospel, but it is also about what? Receiving the revelation that comes from God to you. Hallelujah. When you get that revelation, it is like a light bulb is turned on in your brain and in your heart. And you begin to see Jesus as you ought to see him. And not just somebody that you have heard about. But something comes within you and that begins to transform your life. So that your relationship with him is based not only on what you have heard. Not only on knowledge, but by revelation. Hallelujah. And it says this revelation or this mystery, it was kept secret but since the world began. God knows how to keep secrets. Amen. Amen. One of the things that the Bible says is that if the devil knew that killing Jesus was going to be the thing that would destroy him, he wouldn't have killed Jesus. Amen. That is why it is a mystery. God kept it a secret. So the devil planned and orchestrated all the activities so that Jesus would be crucified. Thinking that by killing him on the cross, that would be the end of all things. But that was the beginning of everything. And not only that, his grip on the human race was broken forever. Amen. Amen. So it is a mystery. And it's important that we come to the place to understand that God has given us something that will help us to live this life just like he intended it to be when he made Adam and Eve and planted them in the garden. And he said that these are the things that I've given you. It's all beautiful. Enjoy it. Be fruitful. Multiply. But Satan took it away from us. And God put in a plan to restore that grace that he gave Adam and Eve in the beginning. And it was a mystery. It was a mystery. And it's all now revealed through Jesus Christ. So, what I want us to understand this morning is that there is something about Jesus that we need 
to be very, very crazy about. We have to be interested in Jesus Christ. Not just what we hear people say. Not just what we think. But to know Him as He is. Paul says somewhere that I may know Him. And the power of His resurrection. Hallelujah. So in this passage, what we are establishing first of all is that the gospel of Jesus Christ is about Christ. And it has to be revealed to us. Jesus must be revealed to us. It must be revealed to us. Jesus is a person. He's, he's a spirit. And he must be revealed to us. And when we come to know him as he is, a lot of things are going to change in our lives. Okay? You will get to see by the time we are through this lesson this morning. That when we come to know Jesus as he is, a lot of things will change in our lives. Amen. Amen. And that is what we are all about anyway. We don't want to come here just to feel good. But I want God to bring a change in my life. I want to see some changes. I want to see life transforming around me. I want to see certain problems that are before me to be moved away. Because I don't like them. Nobody likes problems. Who, who likes problems? Who likes always to have problems? Nobody likes problems. Amen. Amen. We want to overcome. And you see that Jesus Christ in his life. Every single day he dealt with problems by showing his authority over the creation. He always dealt positively. With every situation that he encountered. There was no situation that Jesus could not deal with appropriately. That is why the Bible says that the multitudes they thronged to him. Every single day that Jesus went out there. He was meeting the needs of men and women. Children. Hallelujah. Amen. So if I come to know Jesus. If I come to understand him. The way I ought to know him. I tell you. When I am there in the boat with Jesus Christ. And the storm is raging. And I think that I'm going to die. All I'm going to say is that Jesus. And then there will be what? Peace on that storm. Hallelujah. Yeah. When I have Jesus with me. And my mother is dying. Or my sister is dying. All I have to say is Jesus. And that situation will have to change. Hallelujah. Amen. When I have the issue of blood. And I have spent all that. I can or all the doctors and they have given up. They don't have any solutions scientifically anymore for me. And I come to Jesus and I say, Jesus, my problem must cease instantly. Hallelujah. Amen. There is something about Jesus Christ that we need to grasp. Up to this point, it is like we just hear it. But we must experience him. We must experience him in such a way that even if you have a slight headache, your first, I mean, indication should not be that you want to get a bottle of Tylenol, but you want to call upon him first. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Jesus must come into every circumstance and situation. When we begin to live like that, God will begin to turn us into some supernatural beings in the community. Let me tell you something that is not a secret. It is, you see, there is coming a day, and it is now, that God is going to use ordinary people. Okay? When you read the Bible, ordinary people, just like you and me, you don't have to go to Hollywood to be noticed. But God is selecting people, such as you and I, and He's pouring upon us the oil of the Holy Ghost. And when the oil of the Holy Ghost comes upon you, that is not a natural thing that is taking place. God is preparing you in order to confound the powers that be in the world. Hallelujah. And when we unite to Jesus, that is how it is going to happen. So there's a mystery in this Jesus. As we relate to him, as we associate with him, as we interact with him, as we invite him into our lives every day, something will begin to happen. When you're about to eat your food, you give him thanks. When you're about to sleep, you give him thanks. When you're about to sit in the time back, you give him thanks. When you're coming to church, you give him thanks. Every time you give him thanks, everything you do, you give him thanks. Hey, you infuse Jesus in everything you do. Amen. That mystery will begin to untie things that have been tying you for a long time. 
Because you are infusing Jesus in every aspect of your life. So every knot that is there which is holding you, Jesus will begin to untie those knots little by little. Hallelujah. Amen. Let us turn our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. The book of Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 11. It says, Wherefore remember that ye being in contact Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. You see, some time ago, the Jews regarded the Gentile world, those who were not, anybody that was outside the commonwealth of Israel, anybody that was outside the Jewish nation, the people of Israel, were called the uncircumcised. Okay? You had no access to the God of Israel. There was no way you could call upon Jehovah and be saved. That is why they had all other gods that they worshipped. But there was no God like the God of Jehovah of, of the Israelites. Hallelujah. That is why when God led the Israelites from Egypt to the promised land, it was not just a straight journey. They had to fight battles along the way. Some nations intercepted them, but they defeated them. Hallelujah. Because the Lord Jehovah was with them. Now, the Bible is saying that remember that one time we were Gentiles in the flesh and we were called uncircumcision and we were what? Outside. Outside. Called as circumcision. Well, what? Who we were called uncircumcision by that which is called a circumcision in the flesh made by hands. So the Jewish nation, were, were, they were calling us the uncircumcision. We were outside their culture. And they are God. Let's go to the next verse 12. That at that time you were without Christ. Okay? So it was because they had no Jesus. Being aliens from the commonwealth of what? Israel. So we were aliens. Okay? Do you still remember your alien number? <laughs> How many of you remember your alien number? <laughs> Uh, some of you children don't understand. <laughs> but those of us who came from somewhere, uh, because we were not born in America, we know what it means when they say, what is your alien number? You go to an office, they ask you, what is your alien number? <laughs> uh, you want to look, you want to, you want to fill an application for a job, and, and uh, they ask, what is your alien number? My goodness, alien <laughs> so, I tell you, the Bible says that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. I want you to take note of that sentence. At that time, you were without Christ. What about now? At that time. So now things have changed. So your thinking must begin to conform and be transformed. You conform to God's word and when you conform to God's word, it transforms you. Hallelujah. Amen. Conformity means you are agreeing and identifying with what is being presented before you. You accept it and when you accept it, it begins to transform you. Hallelujah. So at that time, you were without Christ. And you were an alien, a foreigner, from the commonwealth of Israel. And you were a stranger from the covenants of promise. That is why today in America, between the Republicans and the Democrats, Obama being a Democrat, he has signed what? The Dream Act, right? That is going to allow people, children who were brought into this country or who were birthed by uh, illegal 
aliens or whatever people who were came here. Okay, so that those children could be given access to other things, resources that have been cut off from them. A lot of people, especially young ones among us, you don't know. But not everybody you see going around here in America has access to everything that you think. There are a lot of things people cannot have just because they don't have the alien number. <laughs> if you don't have that alien number, you can never, you can never, until you go through a process and they bring you before the officials and they swear you in and you swear allegiance to the flag and the state of America. And then they said, okay, now you are a citizen. Hallelujah. So at one time, we were without Jesus. We were considered aliens from the commonwealth. We were strangers from the covenants of promise. Strangers from what? The covenants of promise. God and Israel had an established covenant. And it began in what? Abraham. When God made a promise to Abraham that I'm going to bless you, Abraham did not have a child. But God told Abraham that you are going to have a child. And even though it was beyond reason that a man of his age should have a child because he was what? In his what? 70s. And God told him that you're going to have a child, right? So naturally, it wasn't going to be possible. And guess what? When God told him that he was going to have a child, God uh, waited again for how many years? 23 years. So by the time that Abraham was going to have a child, he was how many years old? In his 90s. So God allowed him to get to a point where it is humanly impossible. Impossible. You can imagine how many times Abraham tried. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. That is a revelation. Some people do not catch it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. But God kept everything in his own time. The covenant of promise. So if God is bringing us into this covenant, you must know that there is something in store for you and me. Okay? That is what we are trying to uncover. There is something that God has got in store for you and me. And if we can connect to Jesus in a way we are supposed to, those things will begin to unfold one by one. And we shall see the mystery of God become clear before us. Yes. Hallelujah. So we were strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Can you say today that you have no hope? No! We have hope. And that hope is in Jesus. Amen. At one time, we did not have Christ, but now we have Christ. At one time, we, we, we were without God in the world, but now I have God in the world. So it means that since I am now established in a covenant relationship with God, since now I have Jesus Christ in me, once I was outside, but now I am in, once I have no God, but now I have God, then what is next? Is it just eating and drinking, and then tomorrow I die? No. There is something more to life than just food and drink. Hallelujah. And we shall see that in a moment. Let's go to the next verse. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made now by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You who were sometimes, you were far off, but now you have been made what? Now you have been brought close by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Which means that when I relate to God, when I talk to God in prayer, the things that I have to say have to include words about the blood of Jesus Christ. The things that I have to say to God have to 
in good words and names Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ, the blood. Jesus Christ, the blood. Because Christ has brought me now into God. And the blood has brought me closer into the presence of God. Hallelujah. So I must constantly have this word, this name on my lips and in my heart. I must communicate with God constantly using those words. Hallelujah. Amen. Because everything that happened in this world that we see with our natural eyes came as a result of that which was spoken by God. Amen. And so when I also begin to speak, speaking the word that God has supplied to me, and I'm giving it back to him, then the inherent power that is in the blood of Jesus Christ, that satisfied deity, will begin to influence my life. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So now I have been made nine by the blood of Jesus. Once I was so far away, but today I am so close to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's go to the next verse. For He is our peace. He is our peace. Jesus is our peace. Amen. That means that today. Though you might not possess the things that you desire to have in this life, you are not worried. You are not perturbed. You are not disturbed. You are not frustrated. Your hope is in Jesus Christ. There is some peace about you that is beyond understanding. Because when people look at you, when other people are chasing after other things and they are inviting you to join them, in the very crooked ways and you do not participate and you do not understand why you are not joining the crowd it is because there is a peace in your heart that passes all understanding hallelujah it says this Jesus has made both one who has made both one what is the both and what is the one Huh? Who has made both one? Now, the circumcised, who said that? And the uncircumcised. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus has brought us together. The Jew and the Gentile. Okay? He has brought us together. That is why we have now become the spiritual Israel. Amen. Amen. So he has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. So there was once a barrier between us and God. There was a barrier between us and the covenant of God and the promises that he made to Abraham. He says, Abraham, you're going to have a child, but not only one child, but through him, there will be so many in the world as many as the stars in the sky, you cannot count them. As many as the grains of sand on the seashore, you cannot count them. So God promised that he was going to bless Abraham and he has done so. How about you and me? We have become part of that promise. And God has assigned to us a task to carry on that dream, that vision, that promise. So that the next generation that is coming after us, if Jesus Christ is to tarry, they will receive the same promise because we have been obedient to what God gave. Amen. For he is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Alright, let's go to the next verse. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity is in the law of commandments that was contained in the ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man. So making peace. Hallelujah. So God's intention is that having broken down that wall of partition, he is bringing together Jews and Gentiles to make them one in Christ. One man, one body. That is why it is very important that you see yourself as part of each other. Okay? 
We are one family. Amen. We are one. Let us think that way. Amen. When you begin to think that way, you will begin to do things right. Because if this is your house, and you know that you are supposed to be in your house at 10 o'clock or 9 o'clock or 11 o'clock to do something that is important, you know that it is your house. You are not expecting somebody from your neighbor somewhere to come and open your house and to do that thing for you. You go to your house and you do it. Hallelujah. Amen. Only in this concept we are looking at different individuals united and connected by the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. And he says he has made us one in Jesus Christ. So what? Making peace. 16. And that he might reconcile both unto God and in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body. Huh? Both unto God. The Jews and the Gentiles. He's reconciling us unto God in what? One body. And that body is what? Jesus Christ. Okay? So God is bringing Jews and Gentiles. You and I and the Jewish nation. We are coming together and He's uniting us in that one body. And that body is the body of Christ. So everything is about Jesus Christ. When we get outside of Jesus and begin to talk about other people that we feel are more important than Jesus, then we are missing it. And that we might reconcile both unto God, both, the word both, talking about the Gentiles and the Jews, in one body, by what? The cross, having slain the enmity thereby. He slew the antagonism, the enmity, that hatred, that barrier, that wall that separated us has been cut down by Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's then go to the next verse. Yes. Go to 20. I want to skip a few verses. Go to verse 20. Ah. He says that we are built up upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being what? The chief corner stone. Amen. So we are built up. God is building up. Oh, last Wednesday we had a wonderful time here. Hallelujah. Look, if you can, if your schedule allow you, try and come to Wednesday Bible study. It is it's terrific. Amen. I tell you, I, it's like I find myself in my elements very more than Sunday. Sunday is like a rush, but that day is like I have a whole hour. Amen. It's, it's amazing. Amen. Amen. We are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. That means that you and I, we are not just to live anyhow, but we have to be constructing our lives on a certain structure. Okay? So we are not just doing things anyhow. We have to do things in very, very purposely. You, you just can't come to church because you have to come to church. You know, you, know, you don't read the Bible just because you have to read the Bible. You don't sing just because you have to sing. But you do those things with a certain intention, with a certain type of understanding. The foundation of my faith and your faith is built upon the apostles, the prophet, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And last Wednesday at the Bible study, we saw that the foundation of the church was laid by God himself. That's why the Bible says, no other foundation can any man lay 
than that which is vain in Christ Jesus. Isaiah chapter 28 verse 16 tells us that God has laid in Zion a foundation, a sure stone. And anybody who puts in trust in him shall not make haste. The foundation was laid by God himself. Man had no part in it. That is why it is faultless. Okay? The foundation has been laid. Now the structure is being put up. And you and I, we are part of that work. That's why Paul will say that work. We are partners with Jesus Christ. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. He's the one who will establish the structure. We have to hold on to him. We have to hold on to him every time. Every time. Verse 21. In whom all the building fitly framed together. So if you are part of this building, it says all the building, every piece of block that is part of the building must what? Fit together. Okay? So that we can grow. Every piece of brick that is part of the building must fit together on that foundation so that we can what? Grow unto what? One holy temple in the Lord. That is why it is not good for us as a family to be exhibiting some characteristics that is ungodly, such as gossip, such as lying, such as evil concupiscence. I like to use that in January. Last time, last week we used that word, right? Evil concupiscence. Hallelujah. It's a big word. Hallelujah. Makes you feel important. Hallelujah. Very academic. I tell you, the politicians, if we use the word concupiscence, they will wonder what we are saying. We've got big words in the Bible. <laughs> Amen. So, we have to what? Fit together. Now, I want you to understand that for us to be able to move forward, we need to come to a certain frame of mind, certain thinking. There is something about family. When we become family minded, that family mentality, it is easier for the Spirit of God to flow among us. Hallelujah. That is why the Bible can tell us in the book of Psalms, Psalm 133, that what? How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like what? The oil that was poured upon Aaron's head, that ran down his beard. And he came down on his garment and came all the way to his feet. Okay. So it means that it was a whole pitcher of oil that was poured. Because it is just a drop of oil on his head. It will not get, it, you know. So God is wanting to pour upon us that oil when he sees that unity. How good and how pleasant it is that brethren should dwell together in unity. Let us love one another. Coming back. It all happens when we begin to fit into that word, building. <laughs> See, so your thinking must be conformed to Christ. Your thinking, your everything must be about Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, verse 22. In whom? Again, he's talking about Jesus. Anytime he's talking about in whom? In whom? In whom? In whom he also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Hallelujah. This is awesome. So that if you and I fit together into this foundation, then we have become the building in which God is now ready to inhabit us. Because when God is in our midst, hey, I tell you, things that will begin to happen. I'm not talking about God just throwing you from that place to here. That is not what I'm talking about. But you begin to see some amazing results in your life, in your marriage, in your career, in everything that is happening around you. You will begin to impact life and transform life. And when we come to church together and people come among us, they will be so touched by that love and power of God. They will come and fall here and say, 
God, please save me. I need your help. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Because we have become the habitation of God through what? The Spirit. For one of time, let us go quickly to Matthew chapter six, 16. Matthew 16. Verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And he said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? But Simon, and Simon Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood hast not revealed it unto me, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto you, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So, here essentially, Jesus is asking his disciples, Who do men say that I am? And they, they said, some say that you are Elijah. Some say you are one of the prophets. So that was the understanding that people had about Jesus. And then Jesus said, okay, you have heard what others have said about me. But you, my disciples, have been with me all the time. And I move with you from place to place. You have seen the devils cast out. You have seen the dead raised. You have seen the hungry fed. You have seen blind eyes open. I want you to tell me today, who do you say that I, the Son of God, I am? And Peter, being so bold, came out and he spoke to Jesus and he said, Go to verse 17. Verse 16, sorry, I think he said that in verse 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art what? The Christ, the Son of the living God. Thou art the Christ. Christ means what? The anointed one. Okay? Thou art the Christ. Christ means what? The anointed one. That is how we are supposed to see him. Because it is the anointing or that power of God, that ability to do the impossible, that is on Jesus. That is what God wants us to see. Simon Peter said, yes, you are the Christ, the anointed one, the son of what? The living God. If you and I today, I know Jesus, and you know Jesus as the son of the living God, then today, before we live here, you and I should be able to make some declarations. If Jesus is the son of the living God, I must say those things in the name of Jesus. And if God is alive, let those things come to pass today. Preach on, preach on. Hallelujah. And so, verse 17, as soon as Peter said that, Jesus answered and said unto him, Bless Adam. I tell you, when you receive that revelation, when you can come to the point when you can say and call Jesus that you are the Christ, you are the anointing in my life, you are the one who will break through. When I use your name, nothing can stand. When you understand that he's the authority, he's the beginning, the end, the first and the last. If you come to know that he's the one who breaks the yoke, yes, he said that you are blessed. Hallelujah. You are blessed. Blessing comes in knowing Christ. Not only as your Savior, but your redemption in every situation. For flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you. It comes by revelation. Flesh and blood has not revealed it. Which means it was revealed by what? The Father. 
which is in heaven. May God, our Father, today reveal Jesus to you. May He open your eyes to see. May He open your spirit to come to a place where you will see Christ, the anointing on our life. Hallelujah. Verse 18. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, that rock means what? That revelation. That anointing is a rock. That anointing is a rock. That anointing is a rock. It can never fail. When we come to the understanding that we see Christ. Yes. Christ. Christ. Christ in every situation. Amen. Then he will break every year. He says that upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Hallelujah. Yeah. And so, have a chapel. You and I, when we come to the place when we begin to understand that Christ is in us and Christ is working in us and Christ is up on us and Christ is connecting all of us together because he is our foundation. So I must all the time walk hand in hand with you. I must not do anything that will make you look negative but always I must encourage. Always I must pull you along all the time. All the time. We are one. We are one. That anointing is going to work so that the gates of hell will not prevail against us. And before long you will see that there are thousands in this place worshiping the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Finally, let's look at verse 19. Can you play something on the keyboard, please? When we have come to the place where we have seen Jesus, Christ as He is, then it says that. Now that we have come to that place, all you have to understand. Watch it. You have come to the place where you now understand Christ, who he is. And then what happens next? Jesus says, Then I'll give you the keys. I'll give you the keys. I tell you, until we come to that point, we don't have the keys. There is a key that unlocks the door. There is a key that opens things to happen. There is a key. There is a key. There is a key that we must use. So that if there is somebody that is dying here right now. And has come before him. And I have to pray. I don't have to come and be screaming and tossing and rolling about. I just have to use the key. In the name of Jesus. Right. And walk. Clean the world and let us come to Christ. Let us give him our all. For he says that I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever you will bind on us, it shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you lose on earth shall be loose in heaven. I realize that in the church today, as Christians, we spend a lot of time praying. And when we pray, we bind and we lose, we bind and we lose. But we cannot bind and lose if we don't have the keys. Katharia Sakaya. Rosi Kataya. In the name of Jesus. Who do you say Jesus Christ is? Who is he to you? Do not feel that you have to do some strange things to earn the grace of God. Don't feel that you have to do something unusual to earn the grace of God. All Jesus is asking of you to make yourself available. Available. Read your Bible. Pray. Read your Bible. Pray. Turn away from the things that contaminate and give yourself only to God. All these things when you do and you constantly keep in fellowship with Him and He knows that He can depend on you every time when He calls upon you. Then He gives you the keys. How many of you when you have strangers or even friends come to your house then you just give them the master key to your bedroom, to your closet, to go and do anything they like. Man. No 
nobody has unless you are really really related to me in such a way that I now see you as just one of me then I can give you the keys go into my bed go into my closet open that safe and get that thing out and when you have that key you have access to every wealth that is in that house you may be in that house but if you don't have the key there are some areas you can never enter. That is what Jesus is talking to us about. The gospel is about Christ. The gospel has power. It has power. It has the ability to transform us, to bring into our lives the things that we desire. But we need to relate to God in a way so that He can give the keys to us. And I love it when God says that when you and I, we fit together in this foundation. Then we become the building in which God lives what? to dwell. Amen. The habitation of God. Amen. Habitation. There is no place like home. That is where God feels comfortable and He begins to reveal Himself and perform. Hallelujah.